Okay, cool. This is amazing. Keep streaming in the chat. I'm going to jump in and start demoing. Let me explain some things uh, before we get started. So we're talking about composable commerce. So what does that mean? That means instead of just having one monolithic system that comes out of the box, where let's say, um, no, I don't want to pick on anybody in particular. I'll just not use any specific names. But as opposed to just using one e-commerce platform that maybe maybe has all of the features built in, but none of them are what we would call best of breed. Um, so what that means is you could run the risk of getting a jack of all trades, master of none. So your platform does all the things, but doesn't do any one thing particularly well. Um, that can make it hard for you to have a performance site, which is critical for conversions. Can make it hard for you to have a personalized site, which is also critical for um, conversions, order values, et cetera. Upsell, cross-sell, relevant contents to increase the likelihood somebody finds what they want to see and they purchase, they purchase as much as possible. They come back and they see more relevant things that are even more tailored based on how they've been browsing. Um, what we want to do with composable commerce is pick our pieces. And the most important thing here is we want them to feel like Lego blocks, right? You want them to be like Lego blocks. You pull off the shelf and say, great, I would like to connect my segments to my Vercel, to my Elastic Path, to my phrase. And now I've got localized, personalized content. I have a great developer experience so we can push and deploy code quickly. It's using React so people can build the things quickly and iterate on things quickly. It's using Vercel and it's using Vercel Edge middleware to make sure personalization is just as high performance as a static page. Um, that's the dream. And most importantly, we want to be able to iterate on our stack. And that's something where I think this demo will really show you something unique and interesting, which is it's one thing to build a composed stack. It's another thing to manage, iterate, and improve on it. So you could certainly just produce something one time, but uh, my background is working in e-commerce and uh, we had a never ending list of needs from the marketing team of marketing that had to be done, landing pages to be built, iterations and personalizations of the homepage, A-B tests to run, um, net new functionality, and net new sections to add to the site. People are all browsing this page, but nobody's buying. Let's add some promotional content to see what are people missing? Where can we redirect them to? What can improve conversions of these core flows? That's where you start needing something like our visual headless CMS that becomes this visual interface to all of these pieces. So I will show you in a moment how we can grab recommendations from Algolia and we can grab an image from Cloudinary and we can grab these different pieces, position them, personalize them and publish them and just drag, drop and click. It's really cool. It, roles and permissions exist throughout this. So you can decide who can do what. And with all that said, let's actually jump into showing things so you don't have to hear me talk anymore. So. Uh, let's take the demo site. So this is based off of um, a Next.js commerce example that we've forked in the past. Um, the code for this is mostly open source. I actually took our open source example and added a couple of things unique to this demo. So you see some cool secret things. We can follow up the link to the source code. Um, but let's show you kind of what we got. So we've got a simple store that has two, uh, what Elastic Path would call hierarchies, all kind of called collections, because that's a, a generic term many platforms use in some form or another. We got two general collections. We have our apparel co collection, and that's what we're pushing a lot here. So we have this nice, beautifully fast site. Click on things, basically loads them instantly. We can personalize content throughout, which I will show. And of course, we have a fully functioning and beautiful storefront here. Um, now, what is not obvious and is behind the hood is all the things I will show you in a moment. Um, besides localization, personalization, and where the products, media, et cetera, are coming from, it's the ability to manage and customize all of this in a visual interface that I think makes this interesting. And so let's go into the builder UIs and let's actually start over here in our studio tab. Uh, this is kind of cool because this shows you the same site we were looking at, but this is not your typical kind of simple static site. This is something that changes based on what the person viewing um, the attributes your CDP has identified. So let's take a, a simple example. I can still navigate around here. And what's cool is uh, I can hover over areas and see what is visually editable. So the visually editable areas are the things we can edit, remix, personalize in Builder using a drag and drop interface, all connected to your code, all these systems. So I'll edit things like this home page in a minute. I want to show you some other pages. We have this product editorial page. In this case, we've got a, uh, all the product details are coming from code just like you'd expect. But down below, we've created the whole editorial flow below the core product information to be customizable in Builder, because that's really common. You have core product details, shipping info, rating, et cetera, up top. Uh, obviously, add to cart, add your options, et cetera. But then down below, 
you have the story of the product, the background of the product, how the product's made. Um, but more importantly, because it's in this visual CMS, you have the ability to experiment. You can personalize what people see here based on their browsing history. Have you seen them before, their locale, et cetera. Um, you have the ability to run A-B tests to see what can we change in the detailed information that leads to more purchases of this product. You can even see it all the way down to a heat map showing exactly where people have interacted with these sections. And I'll get back to that. And with the really core thing here, which is this is always your stack, meaning you own all of this. You own these components, this website. If you like to use um, Vue.js or Quick.js, if you like to use all kinds of other products and platforms, whatever, you can connect them and you get this thing that feels like a roll your own site builder. I'll show how the visual interface works. But imagine something like Webflow or Wix, but it's all your pieces. It's your favorite services. It's the best of breed media platform, e-commerce platform, presentation platform for you. And you control it. And at the end of the day, it just feels like an easy peasy drag and drop. Now, uh, I want to show you one other thing that we can do here. Let's go to this really simplistic landing page I made, which this is a ultra simplistic. I'll show how this is made. But what I want to showcase here is two things. Um, I don't think I've localized it yet. So I'll show you that in a minute. Um, or actually, no, I have localized this one. I haven't personalized it. So we can change our locale here and we see if we change to the French locale. Um, this should give us our French translation. Uh, now, I apologize. I took French in high school. Don't remember very well. I do remember Mercy. I think I'm spelling it correctly. And so when I localize things, I'll mostly be just making up words. But again, we can see, and I'll show you how the, the workflows work for this. We can see how everything changes based on what the context of the user is. In a minute, I'll show changing things based on audience. So depending on what you shirt, you see something new. Here, we're personalizing with segment. We are showing recommended products through Algolia, et cetera. Um, okay, so let's go actually go into the editing interface and show how we actually combine all these things into a, an easy to use interface. So I'm going to create, let's maybe actually, let's do something interesting. Let's open up our existing homepage. Um, I could have done this from the interface you saw a minute ago, like literally just hit edit on that cool explore your site interface, or I can go into the, the raw content entry. So here I've got a page made out of some components. In fact, uh, let's make a duplicate of this and let's personalize it. And I'll make the duplicate from scratch and I'll show you how that works. So I'm just going to duplicate this. This will carry over some of the basic information. And this gives us essentially a new version. So we're working on a completely new version. Doing this separately allows us to still edit the live one if we need to make spot changes. We found a typo, et cetera. But we now have a separate version that we can actually do whatever we want. So let's actually delete everything and start over. And there we go. So the first thing you'll notice is I'm just taking components that are already in the code and I'm using them visually. So uh, I can say, hello world. Oops, I don't really need that to be all caps. Um, maybe let's treat this like a new visitor page, like welcome new visitor. And we can add whatever content else that we want, lorem, ipsum, et cetera. We can verify this is all responsive as you'd expect. Again, these are the same components that your developers, or if you are a developer, you're already using in your code base. And Builder gives you a really simple way to tag those so we're aware of them. And we use an interesting dynamic rendering system where you basically can do all these cool things, not just the drag and drop with components. Like I'll do a little bit more here. Like let's add some products, make them side by side. Um, I'll show you some other cool tricks too. In fact, I kind of like putting these within a container. We have a container component we use throughout the site. So now these have sort of a maximum width, no matter how wide the site gets, they will never continue to grow past a certain width. And then we can change some things. So let's actually go in here and from our apparel collection, uh, this is pulling products dynamically from our e-commerce platform. So as you update the product catalog, this is a tiny catalog because it's a demo catalog. For a full product catalog, you get a full search interface, uh, just depends on the size and what's needed. Uh, we can change some of the details and variations here, et cetera. But anyway, these are components already in your code. And the way we render them out is almost identical to as if you had hard coded all these pages, except you don't have to hard code all these pages. You don't have to be deploying code because people wanted to test, you know, which product placement makes sense, or should we add an additional section in between two others or whatever. But the important piece is whether we're talking about this composition, the personalization, or the heat map tracking that'll show in a little bit too, or localization, the critical part about builders, we make sure that it's 100% native to your stack. So you own and control everything, replace any piece. Suddenly you don't want to use this, whatever, add, remove, replace all you want. Um, or if you want to use something custom, that's fine. And second, there is never a performance cost. We make sure that when you're doing these things, like traditionally certain uh, legacy forms of personalization can actually use blocking JavaScript and a lot of things that hurt your site's performance. Um, 
I've lived my life in e-commerce for the last decade. And I know deeply and painfully well that making performance worse hurts conversion. So as your site speed goes down, dollars go down. Speed goes up, dollars go up. So simple, yet so difficult to accomplish while meeting all your other needs. And that's sort of the, the thing that we're obsessed with here at Builder is uh, we know we've learned from our past that in order to create personalized, et cetera, you need to be able to have a simple to use interface and it should feel familiar. But in order to deliver and keep conversions high, you need to send these personalized, A-B tested, dynamic variations uh, at the same speed the static page would be sent. And that's where we actually provide this platform uh, as well as open source that helps with that. We make things like Quick and Potty Town. We can talk about that another time. Um, but that also goes to analytics too. So I'll show the analytics, but typically heat mapping, which will show like, that'll tell us kind of who clicked what and how. That also will come at no performance cost because we can do it in a pretty clever way given how the system works. So anyway, we've made this new visitor version of the page, um, but actually what I want to do is that maybe I'll leave the existing homepage for new visitors and let's make a slightly more personalized page for our audience that has shopped the jacket. And so maybe let's go in here and let's target this variation and say, hey, from our audiences, which automatically comes from our CDP, it's actually a really cool system, which is that we call it smart targeting. What it is, is when you make API calls to Builder, which is easy to set up, you forward over any audiences, traits, or other information that come from your CDP. Uh, in this case, these are coming from segments, but they can come from anywhere, and they can come from hard-coded information you know about your visitors. Anything that you collect about your visitors can be sent to Builder, and they will automatically start servicing here. And so let's say, okay, for our jacket shopping audience, we're going to say, hey, welcome, jacket lover. I bet it's cold where you are. Maybe you need more jackets. Maybe you need... Um, what is it that we want to do? Maybe what we want to do is come in here and let's show something a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to drop in a new image component here and maybe I'll make it kind of a nice little lengthwise image. And I'm going to pop in here. And when I choose image, this is going to come from Cloudinary as our media platform. So your digital asset manager, media platform, et cetera. Uh, if you've kind of started to notice the gist, this should feel a lot like a site or page builder, um, but it's connected to whatever best of breed services you want. Again, it's like a roll your own site builder, so to speak. And so uh, this is a cold looking city. I bet you around this time, um, I'm guessing this is New York City, this might be Manhattan, right? That looks like the Empire State Building in the middle. Okay, cool. So let's show them something relevant. Again, we could be targeting this off of locale um, or location. Again, whatever you know about visitors, it pipes in here and now we can start collecting and surfacing. We can add whatever other content we want, but I'm just gonna go ahead and hit publish on this. Now, what we should see is if we go over to our live page and I'll show you another way to view it. I can browse around, I can go to the jacket and other things. And then as I kind of do that, um, we are collecting that basic sort of information. So now that thing should be live. Now by browsing the jacket, and then going back to the homepage, whether it was in the same session or again, let's just open this in a new tab. I'm tagged as a jacket shopper. My CDP identified that because of the events. It saw the pages I was on. Again, fully customizable how you decide these. Um, the rule of thumb with Builder is we don't tell you how to build your own stack. We work with what you have. And so however you're already identifying these things, cool, plug it in. Plug and play is sort of the name of the game. Um, if I go over to shirt shopping and um, you can decide if audiences are uh, can be additive or mutually exclusive. In this case, we've decided shirt shopping is mutually exclusive. So now when I hop back to shirts, I only see shirts. Now, if you're wondering like, okay, how do I debug that? Well, we can go back to that studio tab and I can show you. So we have this nice homepage. This is where I can pop in and say, change my audience. So shirt shoppers see the generic welcome. Um, jacket shoppers should see our awesome jacket lover page. Um, this is awesome because the possibilities here are endless. So I'll show you some more use cases and localization and a few things. So let's take another use case where we showed making a variation of a homepage. So that was taken the exact same page that already exists. And at the same URL, different people see different content. And again, notice how extremely fast it loaded. Let's do this again. Blam. And then let's maybe go to jackets and then going back to it should be lightning fast and cool. And then going to a new page should be lightning fast. Again, we're serving all these things from the edge so they should load instantly regardless of how personalized it is. And you can get extremely detailed with that personalization. It's really cool. We actually have also hooked this up with a webhook to Vercel's uh, on-demand revalidation, I think they call it. So uh, pages are updated essentially real time. I publish an update and it's live on the site within a couple of seconds, just visit and it's there. Um, so let's actually talk about sections of pages here too. So we made a version of a homepage. Maybe we'll make a landing page in a moment and let's make a section. So for our product editorial, 
let's go over here and let's actually start editing this portion of a page. Uh, as a reminder, Builder can create entire pages, sections of pages, both visually or manage structured data. So if you're used to a typical headless CMS that gives you a simple form interface, you can do the same thing in Builder with a live preview and also maintain all those other benefits like personalizing the content, A-B testing, et cetera, which maybe I'll show you some of that now. So down here, maybe we want to show some cool things. Um, I've got two ideas here, actually. One is let's focus on a bit of an editorial. So let's make a version of this targeted at the product page. So that's where I can go into the targeting and say, hey, for the product, that is the, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to do the t-shirt. So for the t-shirt specifically, we're going to show something unique. And let's talk about this backstory of this t-shirt. So maybe I'll, again, take in some of these components that I already have. Um, maybe what I want to do actually is recommend some products automatically. So let's bring in this Algolia component. This is a component that dynamically loads product recommendations. And so I've chosen in this case that I want it to come from our footwear collection. Maybe we'll run an A-B test as an example of like, hey, let's try recommending similar products and let's try recommending complementary products. Let's run a split test right here in the builder interface I'll show you in a minute where we can look at, well, what's converting more? What's driving more dollars? And then we can use that to, again, iterate. The name of the game again is test and iterate because the last thing you want to end up in in a composable commerce situation is what I ended up in back in 2015, which is at shops.com, we built out a brand new composable commerce stack. We were doing it really early. 2015 was a really, really early time to do this. Um, really, really exciting times, but we did not have tooling like Builder where we can go in and just make modifications, change how all these things look and work and feel. And what that led to was a lot of problems. It led to any time we wanted to go in and make changes, try a test, uh, create a new page, et cetera, it was back to engineering. That's a huge issue. So I talked about all the extremely amazing benefits of composability. You can have the fastest, most personalized, best of breed stack, have the best workflows possible, the best asset management, the best deployment of developer experiments, the best localization system, all that. But if you have to hard code it all into your code base, then as if you're a developer, you're really literally writing these things in code, all the changes. This is what my team was doing back at ShopStyle. We were coding up new page, new variation. Oh, it needs to look like this for this audience. Code it, code it, code it, code it. That makes your code a mess and actually can hurt performance because and as opposed to dynamically delivering variations from an API as needed, you're baking it all into the code base, which means rendering and client-side performance incrementally goes down as you add all of these uh, awesome advanced new features. Now, the second issue, though, is if you're not on the developer team, you're on the marketing team, merchandising, product, e-commerce, et cetera, well, now you're waiting for backlogs to get completed and deploys to happen for new things to uh, get launched, whether it's a test, whether it's a page, whether it's a Black Friday takeover. You don't want to be waiting for a few weeks to get to the top of the backlog queue um, and then another week for building, another week for deployment, and then, oh, no, having to roll back. And even worse, this happened to us at ShopStyle is we had Black Friday specific promotions, but we didn't want to deploy on Black Friday or anytime near it. We would do a code freeze like most e-commerce does. Well, again, you don't want to be pushing code at that time, but you need updates to pages. That's where you use a visual interface and in Builder, you can schedule those in advance. We can go up and just pick the date something should be live, pre-schedule. Everlane last holiday season pre-scheduled 100 versions of one page for different days, different times, different audiences, et cetera, all pre-configured, no deployments. And as you can tell with this drag and drop interface, that doesn't just mean you edited this piece of text and that button. That could mean the entire page is different. You have a full page takeover for a, a sale or promotion time that completely focuses on that. Um, I'll talk about landing pages and product launches in a minute, but let me get back to what I promised, which is an A-B test. So in this case, let's run an A-B test of automatically recommended products. You know, try this with a great pair of shoes. And let's go in and let's make another test variation. And now in our test variation, let's not recommend products, let's editorialize this. So let's actually jump in and say, let's go and add a couple Cloudinary images here. So let's maybe do two side by side. And uh, oops, I got the wrong components. I wanted this one. Hold on, let's do this the right way. Let's grab this and grab this. And then let's pick a couple images. Let's see if I have any product photos in our, our asset, in our media library. So let's see, we've got some cool home goods. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any footwear. We've got a nice bag. Um, there we go. We've got this nice footwear. So let's add that in. And again, this uses the same exact roles and permissions you're probably already using. I wanna make this look a little nicer and get this in a container. And now we can also resize this image. Maybe what we can do is, um, 
actually, if this one's kind of about our shirts, maybe we want a shirt photo, maybe we want to talk about it. Again, I'm not a designer, so let's kind of just do this a cool way. Let's do, how about, if this is for a shirt, let's say goes, oops, goes amazing with our jacket. Sorry, refresh. Um, and let's have it have a little bit of text here. Um, try shopping our amazing jackets line. And let's add, so this is the button from our code base as well. So we can add the shop now. For some reason, I keep causing problems here. I don't know why, um, but you'll notice one other thing here too, which is I actually don't have a good title component here. I don't know why I'm missing one, but that's another thing. Oftentimes when you're building in this visual way, you'll find that the components that you need may or may not always does exist in your design system. That's where if you have proper roles and permissions, you can actually go in and make changes to the look and feel yourself. So let's say, okay, this little piece of text is not cutting it. I don't have a special title component, but you can bring in your designers, design team, or anyone with design permissions via roles and permissions, and they can make edits here as well. So this is not limited to just what is pre-built. I'll kind of talk about sort of when this is really handy, but now I could come in here and size and position this, and that's looking a little bit better. This is a little bit more exciting. Now I can fix up, uh, I'll just delete this, and then I can publish this variation. Oops, I got to give it a name. Um, jackets. PDP variation, and there we go. So I've kind of created something brand new. I have two test groups. So one is more about recommending products of another collection entirely. One is more about talking editorial details. I obviously made a mess of this because I'm just kind of coming up with examples on the fly, but this could be a whole background on how these amazing shirts are made, uh, a more detail. Instead of having just a grid of products, this could be a detail on your jacket. In fact, we can actually have our jacket inside of here if we wanted. Like, hey, here's information on the jacket, how to buy the jacket, et cetera. Um, you know, whatever you want to do. We can get that button in here and change it however we want to do it. Or I think this was the button that comes from our design system. You know, cool. Um, but yeah. And now the really, really cool part is if we go over to our live page, we should see momentarily that, okay, great. So we have the version that we were looking at previously. And we should, when we reload this, have that awesome super duper version we just made. Let me check on my targeting and we have our AB test. Cool. Maybe we'll try opening it fresh. And there we go. So now we have that sort of beautiful version that we were just looking at a minute ago. And again, this will be on different pages. So on the shirt page, we, we will see things differently than the jacket page. Okay. So Another thing I want to show, let's show creating a net new landing page and let's localize this one. This is probably a good time to also remind um, to use the Q&A functionality because I do want to make this as interactive as possible and at least take the second half of things to answer as many questions as possible. So let's go back over here and let me do a brand new landing page. So inside here, the nice part is we've uh, hooked this up so that it can allow us to build any pages in any URL. You can add restrictions. So this is uh, customized to whatever your needs are, but let's just call this our Black Friday page. Maybe we'll create a Black Friday page. Maybe then we'll add a link to it. Maybe we'll schedule the link. We'll kind of go kind of wild here. Let me add kind of similar flow as I've done before. So um, shop our Black Friday deals. And maybe I'll do like you saw in another example. Let's just add some generic product recommendations. And again, let's change some of this. I kind of like the row version, kind of like it a little small, smaller. Let's see a bit more, but let's bring in the simple slim kind of cell variants. That's not too bad. And now a really important thing is we want to localize this, right? So we can lock the page in. And then what we don't want to do is we don't want to hard code the localization. We want to use another service. So let's use phrase for that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and we've added the phrase integration. And this is a pretty simple one, actually, too. This is just a click a button in Builder to add and then add one little piece in your code to make sure you're passing the current locale to our API. And then we can hit translate. The source language is English. I'm going to request adding translations in French. And let's fire that away. This takes a minute to communicate with phrase. And we just want them to get the entire data here. Excuse me. So we're going to pull out all of the localizable strings or text here. And so in my components, I have a couple. If I had a very complex page, it would extract everything there. 
Now I had a little link pop up here, but we can also just go to phrase directly, phrase.com. And let's go in and actually translate this ourselves. Obviously this would kick to a workflow to someone else, but anyway, let's go over here. Let's open and great. So we see our Black Friday page job popped in here. We will see the text that came with that, which probably includes things like Black Friday and uh, as well as Shopper Black Friday deals. Perfect. So I'm going to just type in C, Boku. Don't know if I'm spelling this wrong. Forgive me if I am. And that way we can just see these things come back into our system. So I need to accept those. And then this takes a split second in their system. Uh, but again, the idea here in general with composable commerce, especially at a reasonable scale, is not that one person's doing all these things himself. In fact, we tend to like to think of things in terms of um, using one tool for one job. So if you have a translation team, they live and breathe inside a phrase. That's just what they use. They don't even necessarily know how uh, have to know anything about Builder. All they get is when the content team that's creating content, creating variations, et cetera, uh, as soon as that is created, it just gets pushed over to translation system, updates happen, API writes back, and nobody needs to care. So the only thing we need to do now, and, and this is kind of intentional as a separate step, is we want to apply translation. So when you're ready, say, hey, I want to pull in the translations. You'll get a notification when they're available. We can apply them and we can preview them too. And you can always kick back any change you make, whether you want to change or view a difference in translation, or if you want to add something net new and just have the new pieces translated, the workflow is quite seamless and incremental like that. Cool, so we've got our updates applied and beautiful. So when we change to the different uh, French locale, we will see our French localized text. In fact, you'll see it in the builder interface as well. So if you wanted to, you can make changes here. Each input that's localizable will show here and we can make any other uh, we can make any other changes we want or come in and plug any other locale that we like as well. So I don't actually speak any of other languages, but I could type in these and we can preview them. Note that localization applies to roles and permissions too. So certain individuals may only have the ability to create content for a certain locale, edit, review, et cetera. Um, I'm not trying workflows in this process, but you can also have this workflow split into multiple steps with multiple approvers, automated checks, web hooks that fire, et cetera, as opposed to just a, a published task. And anyway, let's go back to our default variation and let's publish our extremely beautiful page here. And so for our Black Friday page, we can also go over to our live site and preview this. And it's essentially instantly available. And we can go to our locale picker. You can set up localization in your site however you want. But we can go over to French and we can see the French version populate here and we get our Merci Beaucoup. Uh, we can go back and change it again. And this can use uh, personalization through localization or it can use a localized uh, website structure, meaning the website paths can update based on each locale. Again, Builder doesn't tell you how to do anything. It just works with what you have as a pretty important rule of thumb. So let me take a question really quickly. So number one thing here we have is, uh, I think this one looks good. So when you publish, what exactly are you publishing? Is some new JSON file put on for sale or is the database changed? Whose code is rendering the page? Is it SSR and CSR, et cetera? Fantastic question. So let me kind of break this down and explain it in, in general terms here. So what is happening when I'm published? So Builder delivers all content over an API. And I can maybe show how this works in a moment. But basically, publishing writes to our backend uh, a JSON format. So forgive me, I'm going to get technical for a second. But this raw data is actually just JSON. In fact, I can look at it and inspect it here. And this is really just a description of, and maybe I can zoom in on this. This is literally a description of what component to render, what options it should have, uh, some of which or all of which might be localized. And then that saves us raw data in our database. When you make an API call to Builder, you request that data and you actually pass in what locale is present. And that way we filter down the data to only include the localized values in it. Um, you can also request the raw data for setting up webhooks and stuff like that. And then what you do is you take that raw data and you can actually store this data in your own database if you like too. There are webhooks for those types of workflows. And then you pass that to a rendering component. So let me actually show you the code for how this stuff works. Um, I have this really cool page. Okay, great. So in this case, I am fetching. So inside of get static props, but again, this is whatever framework you use, however that framework works. All we need to care about is one, we're gonna make an asynchronous request. In this case, this is for a page model. So this is gonna populate the contents between the header and footer. That's just how we built our site and decided that's the case. 
I'll pass in a key, we'll tap, pass in targeting attributes to locale. And then down here, and this is the really important part, besides anything else, like we're using Next.js layouts here. So there's a layout that pulls in header, footer, uh, locale picker, et cetera. And then the page contents is literally just this. This builder component is a component we provide that when you pass in our JSON, the raw data that comes from our API, it can dynamically render any variation. So that's how we're saving and loading this stuff. It can be server-side rendered, it could be client-side rendered, it could be edge rendered, um, it could be statically generated. You could do it any format. Now, what we're specifically doing here is we're using um, incremental static regeneration which with edge middleware. So let me show you what the middleware file looks like. We have a really simple integration here where basically your edge middleware just does one thing, all we do is, and in fact, half of it is just a log that we put in the edge log so you can see the personalized uh, log streaming in. But literally all we do is just say rewrite equals get personalized URL. Uh, that's just how Builder parses the cookies header and that looks at what in personalization information is in there. And then it'll rewrite the URL so that we can have a, an instant loading statically generated page um, that revalidates in the background, which actually gets triggered on publish as well through like on-demand revalidation and then sends to your clients. Uh, the gist of it is you just make a website like you normally would, Next.js, et cetera. You install a couple things, that API call, that renderer, and optionally this personalization middleware, and it just works. If you wanna do client-side personalization, which I'd recommend only in cases where you wanna do more like one-to-one -one personalization, you can do that too. So we chose for this Algolia recommendations uh, components to be client-side rendered. That way it can be personalized on an individualized basis. So the entirety of the page delivers instantly from a pre-generated cache um, based on of all the personalization params. And then on a per individual basis, this will come out. Okay, I'm going to mark that as, as answered. Uh, please anybody else ask other questions though, because there's more cool things I can show, but I wanna make sure I'm answering the things that are most top of mind. So let's show uh, heat maps uh, in a moment. So let me go over here and show you a version of our homepage that's been live for a little time. Again, it's a demo site, but let's look at the analytics on this. Because if you're running A-B tests, if you're doing personalization, you're gonna wanna see insights. Now, two important notes on this. Um, important note one is that this is not hooked up to an actual live store. So we're not getting conversion data, which is unfortunate because that's the most interesting stuff to look at, but that's fine. It would be fake dollars anyway, so you get the idea. Um, the second important thing to note is um, this can be synced to other analytic systems of yours and you can bring other analytics data in here. So what this means is this is not replacing your current analytic systems. This is not replacing Google Analytics or Amplitude or um, what, is, oh, what is Adobe's analytics suite called? It used to be called Omniture. I think it's got a new name. Anyway, it's not replacing that. It's also not replacing Looker or Tableau or anything like that. What it's doing is it's answering for you, how did this content I'm looking at here perform? Because Google Analytics will not tell you that your homepage on this date range had a 50-50 test with this one section and showed a different conversion rate based on clicks to this one section that Builder, you know, you had configured in Builder to look and feel and have difference in variations. And so that's what Builder can show you. And so, but the cool part here is it's not only aggregate data, clicks, click through rate, conversion, conversion rate, order values, et cetera, uh, looking at this stuff over time by device. Um, you could also get into by personalized variations as well. So we can go in and actually say by anything else that we have like variations, how are things different? Meaning uh, how did the jacket lovers versus shirt lovers convert differently? But the heat map is really cool as well. Because when you're making what we call visual compositions, you're adding a hundred products and buttons and stuff. Well, you can go in here and we can say, well, who's actually clicking on what? And if you add our conversion tracking, which is just one line of JavaScript, then you can see the dollar value of everything. And so a really, really cool use case, and I can show you some examples. Let's actually go to two. Let's go to shops.com. This is a company I used to work at. And we'll go to everlane.com as well. Maybe I'll open up Afterpay. What's cool is let's take the shop style page. ShopStyle built all the stuff from scratch at Builder. They didn't even use any components. The developers hooked this up and said, marketing team, you own this page. Do whatever you want. And what came out of it was a very, very beautiful page that the marketing team could change at any point. And the engineering team never, ever, ever has to touch, look at, or think about this page. Um, this page can be personalized. It can be scheduled for certain date ranges. And anything in here, you can look at a heat map on. So it's really cool for cases like these kind of three-way and four-way grids where the marketing team at ShopStyle can actually load the heat map and the conversion overlays and actually see a dollar value for each of these. What you'll tend to find is you'd never get an even split. Something is converting at a way higher rate than other things. Sometimes it's drastic, sometimes it's small. What you could do in a simple strategy I'd recommend here 
is do iteration based off the data you're seeing. That sounds obvious, but let me explain. So let's say this net aparte and farfetch, they are generating fantastic conversions, but this Wayfair just is not. Perfect. Replace it with something else, run it as a test, get it live. Or don't even test it, just replace it and get it live. Check the heat map the next day and see if you have a more even split, right? Every day you can take your winners and try and get them to win more. And you can take your losers and replace them off the site until you really learn quickly what works well and you can eliminate the guesswork. You don't have to do this with crazy engineering workflows. You can click to test, click to view conversions, et cetera. Everlane is a very simple uh, example as well. What's cool is there's a couple extra things on here. One is we've got a mix of kind of no code created content and components from their code base. So these are the product cells from their code base. These are the carousels from their code base, stuff like that. And this is where you can go in and again, see the differences. The beautiful part here is again, unlike a typical um, composable commerce setup, this page can be changed completely. On Black Friday, this page looks completely different. Nothing about this page looks the same as it does today and on Black Friday. And that's a really killer secret to boosting conversions and taking that off of engineering workloads and onto a, a more kind of conversion-driven iterative marketing workflow. Um, second is unlike typical kind of WYSIWYG builders, Everlane owns the stack. Anything that's not built in to the WYSIWYG already can be dropped in. The carousels, the products, et cetera, like you saw, drop it in, publish, and go. And again, this is not limited to pure a merchant selling items e-commerce. Afterpay would be considered maybe fintech, but it's a very e-commerce heavy kind of use case. And again, it looks similar. This is about purchasing, shopping, et cetera. And so they're building up these pages accordingly. Um, so anyway, um, and then also worth noting too, if you run A-B tests, et cetera, you'll see all those analytics side by side and we'll let you know if there's a statistically significant winner. And in the vein of composability, you can hook this up to other systems. You can have the analytics piped to an A-B testing or other personalization solution, let builder power the rendering performance and composition and still get the targeting audience, et cetera, from uh, another service as much as you like. Um, to answer some more questions, and if you'd like to see any specifics in the demo, please let me know. I can show some crazy no-code create from scratch stuff, which I haven't touched yet. Um, great question. Um, so question here, how do developers code these components that work with Builder? This is the most beautiful, important thing that I want any developer watching to take away. You don't. You don't do anything special. You write React components and you register them in Builder. So let me show you what I mean. Let's take a simple component. Let's take that hero component. Fantastic. This is a hero component I got from this Vercel starter. I didn't touch it. Uh, Vercel made this Next.js cool e-commerce thing. It has a hero component built in. It's using, it looks like it's using Tailwind. It could be using other types of uh, material UI components, whatever. Didn't touch it at all. All you need to do is go over and we have this simple builder config file and I'm gonna say hero, great. All we did here is we just registered the components. This tells builder it exists. Um, using a dynamic import ensures that it's not pre-bundled. So you can register infinite components and it has no impact on performance. It only, it only downloads if it's used on a given page. And then give it a couple, two basic things. Give it a name that shows in our UI. If you want to be cool, give it an image. And that way, I'll show you where this displays. That way over, um, how do I get out of the heat map? I should know, I built that. <laughs> okay. Um, that way, uh, when you see this little hero, you see a nice little icon. So. If you provide an icon, you get these nice little beautiful icons. And then you just define the inputs. So the inputs are literally just the props. So this takes two props, a headline and a description. And so that's all I say. I say it takes a headline. This is just like a schema you'd create in any CMS. So you say it takes a headline, the type is text, the default value is whatever you want. And I'm saying it can be localized. Um, things like Booleans or uh, configuration, you wouldn't localize. You wouldn't make a French version of a product ID, um, but you would localize things like text. And then description here. And there you go. Doing all that, it'll show up here. And what's cool is you can update this in real time too. You can actually be developing your components and messing with and builder in a cool visual way. If one day you added new props over here, maybe we have a description too. All we would do is deploy the update to this components and inside it in the same code base, we would also I'll update this TypeScript as well. All we would do is update this, have a description too. And now in the builder UIs, you have a new field for the other description. So completely seamless, the same component you already wrote, you already use, or the same way you'd write components, you just tag and register is what we call it here in builder. That way you can keep your workloads as clean as possible, your DX as clean as possible, et cetera. Um, so when it's done, if you have any follow-up questions, please uh, let me know. Ah. 
Great question from Bastion. I assume that's sort of short for Sebastian. Does this work with Svelte? Totally. This, uh, Next.js and React are totally an example. This actually works with any framework. You can use Svelte, Vue, Quick, Solid.js, Astro, et cetera. Um, that's exciting. We have a really cool way that we're able to do that. It's a whole technology deep dive and go into separately, but it's really neat. So I'm really glad you asked that. Works with whatever, whatever framework you want. Register your components super fast. And uh, Svelte has some really, really great performance characteristics in particular. Um, uh, okay, question here. Can you show how components are created? I noticed the forms option on the screen. Can you touch that, especially the part where it send the data and where? Yeah, good question. So um, I think we showed how components are created here and just a brief kind of touch. In fact, this is something I want to show in general. So let's go in here and let's say we're going to make something new. Actually, I don't want to mess with our home page. Let's go to our landing page because I made it pretty funky looking anyway. And yeah, let's talk about the full kind of no code capability. So I showed taking things that are built in your code base, but there are those use cases of like, what if something's just not built already? What if I just need to make a form? What if I need to embed something? What if I need to just design something kind of bespoke from scratch? That's where you'd use our kind of no code mode. Now, important to note, this depends on roles and permissions. You can decide that nobody's allowed to use no code. It's design system only end to end. That's totally okay, people do that. Um, most customers eventually decide for certain parts of their site, for certain team members, they can actually use full no-code kind of editing and composition. So maybe I'll make something here. Maybe I'll make a new box and maybe I'll do something cool. Why don't we go in and let's give it a background image and we could do some cool stuff. We can pull this from our media library. We can pull this from our uh, media platform, asset manager, et cetera. But now I've got this cool new hero. And let's say we're just trying to solve a basic use case, which is I have a normal hero. And this normal hero has um, a problem, which is it's not exactly very visual and exciting appealing, but it has no buttons. So let's just make our own. We can go in here and let's make a new hero. Let's add some text. I want the text to be centered, maybe in both directions this way. And maybe I wanted to say, you know, shop our Black Friday special deals. And I want to make it larger and move it down. Maybe that's a little bit too large, et cetera. Now I want to add a button and let's, we can add uh, a generic button and that's kind of how the forms work too. I can touch on this here. Actually, whatever, let's put a form inside of this. So for whatever reason, we're going to stick a form right here and we have a complete visual control over these form elements. By default, everything inherits your styling. So this uses Tailwind, which means buttons by default don't have any special styling, but I can add special styling. I think a good contrasting color here, uh, again, please note I am not a designer. Um, but I think a good contrasting color here would be white. And let's actually make the typography black. Sorry, I have a bunch of these zoom windows in my way. Um, and I'd like to add a little bit of padding here, maybe 10 in either direction. Uh, we can add some rounding of the corners if that's kind of our style. Otherwise, take it away and be kind of cool and mysterious that way. Maybe we'll add a little padding on each side. Uh, whoops, let's do, there we go. Cool. And there, we've got a form. Now, the cool part is now you could post the results anywhere. So I can go in here and by default, you can just have it sent to an email address or email alias, but you can actually have the submission go anywhere. So uh, a couple of cool things you could do. One is have forms go to Zapier. So now they can connect to anything. Post to Zapier, we have a doc on this. You basically paste a Zapier hook as the action URL. You can add your own form action URL. If you actually have a form action you want, just put that in here. You can get super advanced with JavaScript handling and post and request uh, options and advanced options. But one of the coolest workflows for forms is just sent to Zapier. Zapier can push the data anywhere, push it to email, Google Sheets, Airtable, uh, et cetera. Um, and that's kind of just making it in no code. Uh, or I can go back and do that other example I was going to do, which is let's add a basic button. Again, I think I liked the white background and the black text. And maybe I want it here and centered. Maybe I want to group these two things and center them vertically, shrink up this excessive space that I no longer need. And I could go in and make responsive changes. So down here, perhaps I think that that text is a little bit large for this size of device. So maybe we'll make two changes. Maybe we will um, make the font size a little smaller for mobile. And maybe we'll make this a little shrunk up for mobile. And there we go. Those changes are specific to mobile. So we did not affect desktop. Maybe we go even a little bit smaller. 
Desktop still has large everything, mobile has smaller, and that's just generating responsive CSS. Very, very simple and easy in your design team to come in. What's cool too, is you can register these in Builder as templates or symbols. So let's do this, let's save as template, call it cool hero. And now let's say we're making a net new page, we're doing whatever, we can drop that in from our templates library. So cool hero can be dropped in anywhere. Actually, I wanna delete this last layer I have. And now cool hero can be dropped in and customized however we want, wahoo. And still it has all that nice responsiveness. So now you can kind of create this asset library internally. And again, we don't need code for all these things. We can use code. We wanna use code when we need to, uh, but kind of don't want to if we don't need to. So I hope that makes sense around forms and kind of the creation of these with code or even without code, like no code. Okay, let's answer a few more here. Um, I was like, oh, okay, good question. So uh, a follow-up question, how does deployment work? Any limitations or requirements on hosting? So no limitation at all. That's the amazing part. Builder actually is just a headless CMS. Um, so the same way you would build your site with whatever technology you want to build, you deploy and host it however you want to build and deploy and host, and you just connect the content over an API. Same with Builder. So most people have a website. All these people, ShopStyle, Everlane, Afterpay, they already had websites, all different tech stacks. ShopStyle's Angular, uh, Everlane is React and Next.js. Uh, Afterpay originally was Ruby on Rails. Uh, I believe it was, it was, I believe Ruby on Rails. It was something that was not like a front end component system. And then they moved over to Next.js. Uh, side note, really cool benefit of Builder is all the same content works across framework. So if you build things in Builder, for React and then you migrate to Svelte, everything created in Builder migrates cost instantly. So when Afterpay moved from uh, a Ruby based, I believe setup to Next.js, everything in Builder just carried across. That was the only thing that did not need to be migrated. But um, so again, they had a website, they had a hosting platform, everybody uses a different setup and plugin in Builder was just an API call and it works. The only exception here is personalization. If you want to do that high-speed personalization so that you can configure, like again, because Builder's an API, you just hit the API, you say, here's the locale, here's what we know about the visitor, give me the piece of content, the page, the section, the data, whatever. And then you render that however you want. Now, if you don't have a hosting setup so that you can't deliver separate pages in a fast way that are personalized, um, that means that you can't... Um, um, you know, you can make the APKs to Builder, but you still need to end-to-end -end serve those. That's where you probably want to use a CDN. So if you want something end-to-end -end out of the box, for yourself, it's a fantastic option. If for whatever reason that's not an option, you could use a CDN like uh, CloudFront, Cloudflare, et cetera. Any CDN that's scriptable, you can put as a layer in front, and that's where you can do the splitting so that your site can then serve personalized pages fast. As long as your site can do it, then hitting the Builder APIs with personalized information works beautifully. And the example of the starter we have here with Vercel works amazingly. So let me mark that one. Uh, but please, again, any follow-up questions, please go ahead and ask. Um, can you add Tailwind classes from the design system? Yes, you can actually. Um, so we actually have the ability. And what's cool here too, um, let's go ahead and let's see. Actually, we have like, um, let's like recreate. This will be kind of funny, actually. Let's do this. We have this hero. What if we recreate this hero using our Tailwind style so that it all continues to stay on brand? So what's cool is let's go back to the hero and let's add these classes. And so I'll go over here. I'll go to the little advanced thing and CSS classes. <laughs> awesome. And let's add, let's see, class name s.root. I think we're pulling in, sorry, let me just see what the h2 classes are. s.title, s hero module. Are we getting title? Fantastic. Here's the title styles. Let's steal those. Let me add a title, um, new title. And let's apply these classes, oops, down here. And what's really cool about Builder too is everything is pluggable. Why is something, okay, anyway. Everything can be modified with plugins. I'm guessing I'm missing a higher level class. Sorry, there's a couple layers here. I probably need this s.roots. So let's go hero, CSS, roots, um, flex, flex call, py, 16, mx, auto. I don't think that's gonna give us what we want. Anyway. Uh, sorry, you can see how I'm pulling in the Tailwind classes here. And what's nice is you can save these as templates. I probably did something wrong, so we're not seeing that nice kind of black text. Uh, I think somewhere I'm missing a specific text style, um, or I'm, it could be an overwrite in CSS. But anyway, these styles are coming from Tailwind. You can see we actually applied things like the width, max, XL, et cetera. I can go in and override the typography here to be black so we can see it. Um, but... 
But actually, maybe I applied the description style instead of the headline. Anyway, you get the idea. And what's cool is you can save these. If you save this as a template and you have your non-developers use them, when you update Tailwind configs, everything else here in Builder applies automatically as well. So you can, in the UI, create all these pieces that are reused, applied, et cetera, and they're always specific to your design token primitives, which is really neat. In that case, you'd probably disallow the majority of editors to use the bespoke styling, or you give it to a limited number of people and say, use it with caution, use Tailwind first, et cetera. But what I was gonna mention too is Builder is very pluggable. You can actually create plugins that are UI components that live right here in the editor. And so one thing that's been kind of mentioned and I've heard people kind of interested in working on, and it's never too late, would be to create a Tailwind plugin here. So you have a Tailwind UI of picking Tailwind classes and those just apply. It's surprisingly easy to do and you could jump in Discord to talk to us about it because I think a Tailwind plugin where you can choose UIs but it applies Tailwind classes and it's always on brand would be a really, really cool thing to add. And we do all the plugins open source. So that'd be a really cool one, excuse me. Let's see, uh, on create defined custom function side builder. Oh, ha -ha. yes, this is, a, this is an interesting one. So um, question here is um, uh, actually two. This one's really easy. So one, thank you for saying this is really great content. I'll have to rewatch. Um, the question is will you share the recording um, and great overall demo and answers. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yes, we will absolutely share this recording. We'll send a follow-up email with it. It'll also be live on YouTube, I believe, but it'll all be in the email so you can rewatch. Um, see if you could spot where my demo went wrong. There was one spot where my demo did not behave as expected because I probably broke something a minute before dropping on here. <laughs> and I try not to make it obvious. I'm curious if anybody else uh, uh, catches it. Um, but anyway, let's see. Uh, app is in pages. Oh yeah. So actually uh, two last good questions and then we can kind of wrap up here. I think we're getting close to time anyway. So this is a good one. Um, is this ready to be used with Next.js 13.4 or above where you use the app directory instead of git static props? The beautiful answer is yes, 100%. So all this stuff doesn't matter. I showed rendering via git static props. You could fetch in the app directory. It all works the same. And we actually added docs specific to the app directory now. So you can see that you make the request in an async component and then you pass it through and to the builder component to render. We also have a React server components specific SDK coming in the next probably month or two where the entirety of the builder experience is server side to the client side. What that means is you can use async React components as these building blocks so that the, um, uh, you said, uh, sorry, I read a comment, which is a funny one. But anyway, you can create these async server side render components and use them in the builder editor. That will come soon, but there's already a way to do that now. Um, funny one from Bastion. Uh, I said refresh sometime during the video demo. Was that because of the error? Uh, yes, I believe so. <laughs> when I was like, oops, I need to refresh. That's because I hit an error, uh, probably a broke. I was making updates to this demo a minute before jumping on and I probably broke something. Um, something very, very small and it's probably the silliest line of code. One other question here is, um, can a button have an on-click prop passed down? How would one create defined custom function inside Builder? This is a really, really cool question. So the answer is yes, you actually can have buttons with custom on-click. So uh, let's actually go back here and maybe let's make this bigger and more exciting. And let's, that's our cool new hero. Uh, that should also have the other responsive Tailwind classes too. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, let's add a button. Let me show you adding some custom on-click handling. So what's really, really neat, and this requires developer permission, so only accessible to developers. But what's cool that you can do here is you get access to this data tab. The data tab is really, really cool. It's really powerful. Um, we don't, <laughs> you don't want to let anybody other than developers have access to it. And that's easy in the roles, permissions UI. So we can do a lot of things here. Uh, we can create dynamic data binding. So we can actually bind data from other systems to this page. Like we can pull data from another CMS, an e-commerce platform, et cetera. And we can actually visually say, hey, this title will always come from this PIM content platform, commerce platform, Elastic Path product title displays here, whatever. It's, it's cool. We don't have time to show all that. But let's show this specific question. So um, you could do other crazy stuff, like have content with inputs. It's like components, blah, blah, blah. You can add custom code. Uh, but let's go into that. So this is, a, let's add a, actually, I don't want that to the text. I want it here. Let's add a custom on-click handler. So on-click, we can add actions. Uh, there's some built in. You can create plugins to build custom actions too that give a nice friendly UI, like creating state changes, which can create interactive content, which is a whole separate thing, but really cool. Tracking custom events. But let's add custom code here. And what's really cool about this is this can be code from your application. So let me show an example. Uh, I'm going to show a fake example. I actually have this running locally, but um, it's going to take a minute to connect it. So I'm just going to not bother with that. But let's do this. When we have that builder component, we have it over here. We can also pass down context, which is cool. 
So context, you can pass whatever you want. Let's say we pass in the alert function and that just does alert high. Um, never do that, but you get the idea. Um, now this is actually accessible anywhere inside a builder. This becomes part of a context object. So we can say on click, we can go context.alert. Now this is not hooked up to my local. Actually, why don't we just hook it up to my local? Let's just do that. Hold on, this will be fun. I'm gonna save that. I've got my local server running. Excellent. I'm going to, I think it's on localhost 3000. Thought it was on localhost 3000. Let's go in here. Let's try this again. And I'll show you exactly what happens here. It's pretty neat. Try this again. Are we on localhost 3000? Oh, HTTPS. That's why localhost is HTTP. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go over here. I'll show you what the local development here is, is like, actually. So I'm going to replace this with that. So now we're going to run off of localhost 3000. Cool. Um, I'll show you a couple other cool things. But now we should be able to go in here. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Sorry, I clicked the button. So um, context.alert. So just as a reminder, apologies for jumping around. So I passed this context thing called alert, and it just calls an alert. Now, if I call that function, I could pass arguments, whatever. When I click this button, I'm going to get an alert. We can add conditional logic to not show when in the editing mode, but that's really cool. This allows you to pass data and um, uh, functions down to be called from Builder. Um, and I mentioned data. Let me show you. So let's go title, um, hello world. So we're passing some, this could be product data, this could be whatever. And now what's cool is we can bind this data. So because I pass that data down, I can go in here and I can pull, I think we have title. Do we call it title? Maybe I need to refresh so that it pulls in the latest because I don't think I have hot reload. Oh, sorry, I need state for that, apologies. We have this thing called for data, you wanna use data. I should have known that. Title, hello, world. Um, I forget if this hot reload, so it's instantly available. Let's take a look. Yeah, there we go. Hello world. And go back and change it. Da, 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 and it'll pull it in. So this is how we can sync data in and out of the system entirely, which is quite cool. But the last thing that's neat here, and then if any other questions, please let them, uh, please just drop them in. Otherwise we'll wrap here shortly. Um, we can also locally develop our components. So in the hero component we have, uh, let's say we have this headline and description, very cool. Let's say over in hero.tsx, I want to make the description the description is going to yell at you, and there we go. It's all caps. I can even show you this side by side. It works with hot reload. So let's get rid of that. Cool. It's back. Let's remove it. Awesome. Uh, let's add that. Remember we added description two. Is that still in here somewhere? Um, we can go ahead and add that description two. Uh, description two. And I can add this prop description two. And then TypeScript won't be happy. So let's put this here. And then we can go to that builder configuration. And in hero, we can add a new description to field. And now we can start visually editing it. So we can go in here and say, wahoo. And now we can see it pop in. We can localize it, et cetera. Anyway, I just want to show you the kind of development experience. The whole idea is seamless, interconnected, et cetera. Sounds a little bit utopian, but it actually is real, especially in this composable context. So. Maybe we'll wrap it up here. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. This was a ton of fun. The questions were fantastic. We'll follow up with a recording and a bunch of resources. Mike, thank you for adding resources in the chat. Uh, it was really exciting. Um, I appreciate nobody noticed my, my little piece of demo that was broken. And um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this. Build your own site page visual interface to whatever commerce assets, media, personalization, whatever you have. It's all interconnected. It all works through existing systems but it does not give you this horrible organizational lock-in where engineers are building out pages and sections of tests. It just works. Drag, drop, make the pages, make the tests, make the personalizations, deliver it fast. Developers make interesting components connected to the surfaces you want, doing all kinds of wild, crazy things. And please build some cool stuff. You can find me on Twitter or any social media. I'm usually Steve8708, just about anywhere. And uh, thank you so much, everybody. I really, really enjoyed this. And we'll have another webinar in the future. So hopefully I'll catch you then. See ya.